Hello guys and gals, and this is part 28 of our reading of George Orwell's 1984. As always, we'll be starting with the copyright information here. This book is copyright 1961, and it clearly says all rights reserved, including the right to reproduce this book in part, therefore, or thereof, in any form. So, that's basically what we're doing. Anyways, um, in the last video... Um, Winston had seen himself in a mirror and was horrified by how emaciated he was, but they are treating him better and he's getting stronger. So he's probably still getting tortured quite a bit. We're going to see what's happening here because, um, it's getting close to being done. Also, um, it does get kind of violent and there are some themes here that are kind of extreme, but, um, that's basically... A warning that if you're sensitive to that, then um, probably best not to watch this video. There are other videos you can watch. Anyways, let me take out the bookmark. And we're going to um, pick up from where he left off. In this one, he found himself getting stronger. His mind grew more active. He sat down on the plank bed, his back against the wall, and the slate on his knee, and set to work deliberately at a task of re-educating himself. He had ca ca capitulated that was agreed that was agreed in reality as he he saw now he had been ready to capitu capitulate long before he had taken the decision from the from the moment when he was inside the ministry of love and yes even during those minutes when he and Julia had stood helpless while the iron voice from the telescreen told them what to do he had grasped the frivolity and shallowness of his attempt to set himself up against the power of the party. He knew now that for seven years the thought police had watched him like, like a beetle under a magnifying glass. There was no physical act, no word spoken aloud that they had not noticed, no train of thought that they had not been able to, to infer. Even the speck of whitish dust on the cover of his diary they had carefully replaced. There, no, they had played... They had played soundtracks to him, shown him photographs. Some of them were were photographs of Julia and himself. Yes, even he could not fight against the party any longer. Besides, the party was in the right. It must be so. How could the immortal collective brain be mistaken? By what external, external standard could you check its judgments? Sanity ha was... Statistical. It could just check. Oh. It was merely a question of learning to think as they thought only. The pencil felt thick and awkward in his fingers. He began to write down the, the thoughts that came into his head. He wrote first in large clumsy capitals, Freedom is slavery. Then almost without a pause, he wrote beneath it, Two and two make five. But there came an, but then there came a sort of check. His mind, as though shying away from something, seemed unable to concentrate. He knew that he he knew that he knew what came next. But for the moment, he could not recall it. When he did recall it, it was only by consciously reasoning out what it must be. It did not come on its own accord. He wrote, "God is power." He accepted everything. The past was alterable. The past never had been altered. Oceana was at war with East Asia. Oceana had always been at war with East Asia. Jones, Aronson, and Rutherford were guilty of the crimes they were charged with. He had never seen the photograph that disproved their guilt. He had never existed. He was, he had invented it. He remembered, remembering contrary things, but those were false memories products of self-deception how could how could it all oh how easy it all was only surrender and everything else followed it was like swimming against the current that swept you backwards however hard you struggled and then suddenly deciding to turn around and go with the current instead of opposing it nothing had changed except your own attitude 
the predestined thing happened the predestined thing happened in any case. He hardly knew why he had ever rebelled. Everything was new was easy except except anything could be true. The so called laws of nature were nonsense. The laws of gravity were nonsense. If I wished, O'Brien had said, I could float off the floor like a soap bubble. Winston worked it out. If he thinks he floats off the floor, and if I simultaneously think I see him do it, then the thing happens. Suddenly, like a lump of submerged wreckage breaking the surface of the water, the thought burst into his mind. It, do- it doesn't really happen. We imagined it. It's a hallucination. He pushed the thought under instantly. The fallacy was obvious. It presupposed that somewhere or other outside oneself there was a real world where real things happened. But how could there be such a world? What knowledge have we of anything, save through our own minds? All happenings are in the mind. Whatever happens in all minds truly happens. He had no He had no difficulty in disposing of the fallacy, and he was in no danger of succumbing to it. He realized, nevertheless, that it ought never to have occurred to him. The mind could develop a blind spot whenever a dangerous thought presented itself. The process should be automatic, instinctive, crime stop, they called it in Newspeak. He set to work to exercise himself in crime stop. He presented himself with propositions. The party says the earth is flat. The party says the ice is heavier than water. And trained himself in not seeing or not understanding the arguments that contradicted them. It was not easy. It needed great powers of reasoning and improvisation. The arithmetical the arithmetical problems raised, for instance, by such a statement as 2 plus 2 makes 5, were beyond the intellectual, beyond his intellectual grasp. It needed also a sort of athleticism of mind and ability at one moment to make the most delicate use of logic, and at the next to be unconscious of the crudest logical error. Stupidity was as necessary as intelligence and as difficult to attain. All the while, with one part of his mind, he wondered how soon they would shoot him. Everything depended on depends on yourself, O'Brien had said, but he knew that there was no conscious act by which he could bring it nearer. It might be ten minutes, hence or ten years. They might keep him for for years in solitary confinement. They might send him to a labor camp. They might release him for a while, as they sometimes do. It was perfectly possible that before he was shot, the the whole drama of the arrest and interrogation would be enacted all over again. The one certain thing was that death never came at an expected moment. The tradition, the unspoken tradition, some somehow you knew it, though you never heard it said, was that they shot you from behind, always in the back of the head, without warning, as you walked down the corridor from cell to cell. One day, but one day was not the right expression, just as probably it was in the middle of the night. Once he fell into a strange, blissful reverie, he was walking down the corridor waiting for the bullet. He knew that it was coming in another moment. Everything was settled, smoothed out, reconciled. There was no more doubts, no more arguments, no more pain, and and no more fear. His body was healthy and strong. He walked easily with the joy of movement and with a feeling of walking in sunlight. He was no lo- He was not any longer in the narrow white corridor of the Ministry of Love. He was in the enormous sunlit passage a kilometer wide down which he had seemed to walk in the delirium induced by drugs. He was in the golden country following the foot track across the old rabbit-cropped pasture. 
he could feel the short, springy turf under his feet and the gentle sunshine on his face at the edge of the field where the elm trees or were the, the elm trees faintly stirring and somewhere beyond that was the stream where the dace lay in the green pools under the willows. Suddenly he started up with a shock of horror. The sweat broke, broke out on his backbone. He was heard Oh, he heard himself cry aloud, Julia, 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 my love, Julia. For a moment he had been, he had had an overwhelming hallucination of her presence. She had seemed to be not merely with him, but inside him. It was as though she had got into the texture of his skin, and that moment he had loved her far more than he had ever done when they were together, and free. Also, he knew that somewhere or another she was still alive and needed his help. He lay back on the bed and tried to compose himself. What had he done? How many years had he added to his servitude by, the, by that moment of weakness? In another moment, he would hear the tramp of boots outside. They could not let such an outburst go unpunished. They would know now, they would know now, if they had not known before, that he was breaking the, the agreement he had made with them. He obeyed the party, but he still hated the party. In the old days, he had hidden a heretical mind beneath the appearance of conformity. Now he had retreated a step further. In the mind, he had surrendered, but he had hoped to keep the inner heart inviolate. He knew that he was in he was in the wrong and he preferred to be in the wrong they would understand they would understand that o'brien would understand would understand it it was all confessed in that single foolish cry he would have to he would have to start all over again it might take years he ran a hand over his face trying to familiarize himself with the new shape there were deep furrows in his cheeks, and the cheekbones felt sharp, the nose flattened. Besides, besides, since last seeing himself in the glass, he had been given a completely new set of teeth. It was not easy to preserve inscr inscrutability when you did not know what your face looked like. In any case, mere control of the features was not enough. For the first time, he perceived that if he want, if he... If you want to keep a secret, you must also hide it from yourself. You must know all the while that it is there, but until it is needed, you must never let it emerge into your consciousness. In any shape that could be given a name. From now onwards, he must not only think right, he must feel right, dream right, and all the while must keep his hatred locked up inside in, up inside him like a ball of matter which was part of himself and yet unconnected with the rest of him. A kind, uh, a kind of cyst. One day, they, want, they would decide to shoot him. You could not tell when it would happen, but a few seconds beforehand, it should be possible to guess. It was always from behind, walking down a corridor. Ten seconds would be enough. In that time, the world inside him could turn, could turn over. And then suddenly, without a word uttered, without a check in, in his step, without a change, changing of a line in his face, suddenly the camouflage would be down, and bang, would go the butter, the batteries, the batteries of his hatred. Hatred would fill him like an enormous roaring, roaring flame, and also in the same instant, bang, bang, would go the bu the bullet, too late or too early. They would have blown his brain to pieces before they could reclaim it. The heretical thought would be unpunished, unrepen um, unrepented, out of their reach forever. They would have blown a hole in their own perfection to die hating them. That was freedom. He shut his eyes. It was more difficult than accepting... And intellectual discipline. 
it was a question of degrading himself, mutilating himself. He had got to plunge into the filthiest of filth. What was the most horrible, sickening thing of all? He thought of Big Brother, the enormous face, because of constantly seeing it on posters, he always thought of it being a meter wide. With its heavy black mustache and the eyes that followed you to and fro, seemed to float into his mind of its own accord. What were his true feelings towards Big Brother? There was the heavy tramp of boots on in the passage. The sealed door swung open with a clang. O'Brien walked into the cell. Behind him were the waxen-faced officers and the black-uniformed guards. Get up, said O'Brien. Come here. Winston stood opposite him. O'Brien took Winston's shoulders between his strong hands and looked at him closely. Have You have had thoughts of deceiving me, he said. That was stupid. Stand up straighter. Look me in the, in the face. He paused and went on in a gentler tone. You are, you are improving. Intellectually, there is very little wrong with you. It is only emotionally that you have failed to make progress. Tell me, Winston, and remember, no lies. You know that I am always able to detect a lie. Tell me, what were, are your true feelings toward Big Brother? I hate him. You hate him? Good. Then the time has come for you to take the last step. You must love Big Brother. It is not enough to obey him. You must love him. He released Winston with a little push towards the guards. Room 101, he said. Oh boy, this is going to be bad. We are to part five. At, at each stage of his imprisonment, he had known or seemed to know whereabouts he was in the windowless building. P possibly there were slight differences in the air pressure. The cells where the guards had beaten him were, be were below ground level. The rooms where he had been interrogated by O'Brien were high up near the roof. This place was many meters underground, as deep down as it was possible to go. It was bigger than most of the cells he had been in, but he hardly noticed his surroundings. All he noticed was that there were two small tables straight in front of him, each covered with a green bays. One was a meter or two from him. The other was further away near the door. He was strapped upright in a chair so tightly that he could could move nothing, not even his head. A sort of pad gripped his head from behind, forcing him to look straight in front of him. For a moment he was, he was alone. Then the door opened and O'Brien came in. You asked me once, said O'Brien, what was in room 101? I told you that you knew the answer already. Everyone knows it. The thing that is in room 101 is the worst thing in the world. The door opened again. A guard came in carrying something made of wire, a box or basket of some kind. He sat it down on the, far, the, further, ta the further table because of the position in which O'Brien was standing. Winston could not see what the thing was. The worst thing in the world, said O'Brien, varies from individual to individual. It may be burial alive, or death by fire, or by drowning, or by impalement, or fifty other deaths. There are cases where, where it is some quite trivial thing, not even fatal. He had moved a little to one side so that Winston had a better view of the thing on the table. It was an oblong wire cage with a handle on top for carrying it, for carrying it by, fixed to the front of it was something that looked like a fencing mask a fencing mask with the concave side outward although it was three or four meters away from him he could see that the cage was divided lengthways with two compartments and that there was some kind of creature in each there they were rats in your case said o'brien the worst thing in the in the world happens to be rats a sort of premon premonitory tremor, a fear uh, of he was not uh, a fear of he was not certain what had passed through Winston as soon as he caught his first glimpse of the cage. But at this moment, the meaning of the mask-like attachment in front of the sudden of um, attachment in front of it suddenly sank into him. 
His bowels seemed to turn to water. You can't do that, he cried out in a high, cackling voice. You couldn't. You couldn't. It's impossible. Do you remember, said O'Brien, the moment of panic that used to occur in your dreams? There was a wall of blackness in front of you and a roaring sound in your ears. There was something terrible on the other side of the wall. You knew that you... You knew that you knew what it was, but you dared not drag it into the open. It was the rats that were on the other side of the wall. O'Brien said Winston, making an effort to control his voice, You know this is not necessary. What is it that you want me to do? O'Brien made no direct answer. He, When he spoke, it was in the schoolmasterish way that he sometimes affected. He looked thoughtfully into the distance, and as though he were addressing an audience somewhere behind Winston's back. By itself, he said, pain is not always enough. There, there are occasions when a human being will stand out against pain, even to the point of death. But for everyone, there is something unendurable, something that cannot be contemplated. Courage and cowardice are not involved. If you are Failing from a, if you are falling from a height that is not cowardly, oh, it is not cowardly to clutch at a rope. If you have, if you have come up from deep water, it is not cowardly to fill your lungs with air. It is merely an instinct which cannot be disobeyed. It is the same with the rats. For you, they are unendurable. They are a form of pressure that you cannot withstand, even if you wish to. You will do what is required of you. But what is it? What is it? How can I do it if I don't know what it is? O'Brien picked up the cage and brought it across to the nearer table. He sat it down carefully on the, on the bay's cloth. Wilson could hear the blood singing in his ears. He had the feeling of sitting in utter loneliness. He was in the middle of a great empty plain, a flat desert drenched with sunlight with sunlight, across which all sounds came to him out of immense distances, yet the cage with the rats was not two meters away from him. They were enormous rats. They were at, at the age when the rats' muzzles grow, grow blunt and fierce and, it, and his fur brown instead of gray. The rats, said, said O'Brien, still addressing his invisible audience, although a rodent is carnivorous, you are, you are aware of that. You will have heard of the things that happen in the poor quarter of the town, of this town. In some streets, a woman dare not leave her baby alone in the house even for five minutes. The rats are certain to attack it. Within quite a small time, they will strip it to the bones. They also attack sick or dying people. They show astonishing intelligence in knowing when a human being is helpless, there was an outburst of squeals from the cage. The, it seemed to reach Winston from far away. The rats were fighting. They were trying to get at each other through the, the partition. He heard also a deep groan of despair. That, too, seemed to come from outside himself. O'Brien picked up the cage and, as he did so, pressed something in it. There was a sharp click. Winston made a frantic effort to tear himself loose from the chair. It was hopeless. Every part of him, even his head, was held unmovable. O'Brien moved the cage nearer. It was less than a meter from, from Winston's face. I have pressed the first lever, said O'Brien. You understand the construction of the cage. The mask will fit over your head, leaving no exit. When I press this other lever, the door of the cage will slide open. These starving brutes will shoot out of it like bullets. Have you ever seen a rat leap into the air, leap through the air? They will leap into your face and bore straight into it. Sometimes they attack the eyes first. Sometimes they burrow through the cheeks and devour the tongue. The cage was nearer. It was closing in. Winston heard a succession of shrill, of shrill cries, which appeared to be occurring in the air above his head. But he fought furiously against his panic. To think, to think, even with a split second left, to think was the only hope. Suddenly, the foul, musty odor of the brutes struck his nostrils. 
there was a violent convulsion of nausea inside of it, inside him, and he almost lost consciousness. Everything had gone black. For an instant, he was insane, a screaming animal. Yet he came, yet he came out of the blackness, clutching an idea. There was one and only one way to save himself. He must interpose another human being, the body of another human being, between himself and the rats. The circle of the mask was large enough now to shut out the vision of everything else. The wire door was a couple of hand spans from his face. The rats knew that what was coming now. One of them was leaping up and down. The other, an old scaly grandfather of the of the um, Severs stood up with his pink hands against the bars and fiercely sniffed, snuffed the air. Winston could see the whiskers and the yellow teeth. Again, the black panic took a hold of him. He was blind, helpless, mindless. It was a common punishment in Imperial China, said O'Brien, as didactically as ever. The mask was closed was closed on his face. The wire brushed his cheek, and then, no, it, it was not relief, only hope, a tiny fragment of hope. Too late, perhaps, too late, but he had suddenly understood that in the whole world there was just one person to whom he could transfer his punishment, one body that he could thrust between himself and the rats, and he was shouting frantically over and over, Do it to Julia! Do it to Julia! Not me! Julia! I don't care what you do to her! Tear her face off! Strip her to the bones! Not me! Julia! Not me! He was falling backwards into enormous depths, away from the rats. He was still strapped in the chair, but he had fallen through the floor, through the walls of the building, through the earth, through the oceans, through the atmosphere, into outer space, into the gulfs between the stars, away, always away, away, away from the rats. He was light years distant, but O'Brien was still standing at his side. There was still the cold touch of the wire against his cheek, but through the darkness that enveloped him, he heard another metallic click and knew that the cage door had clicked shut and not open. And we will pick up with part seven here. Oh, uh, no, that's six. Part six when we continue. Let's see what page we're on. Okay, we have nine pages left. That's not bad. We have been reading from George Orwell's 1984. If you like this content, make sure you like and subscribe and ring the bell so you know when I upload. And if you'll support me in any way, all that information will be in the description below. As always, thanks for watching, everyone, and have a great day.